All right. Good morning, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, it seems to be working. Okay. Fantastic. All right. So um, as the title suggests today, we're going to be talking about um, transition metals in organic synthesis. And this is a chapter that is underrepresented in the textbook, in my, in my opinion, just for the simple reason that if you go into any chemistry lab, in fact, if you went into my lab, um, I would say about 70% of the reactions that we do fall under this bigger umbrella of transition metal catalyzed uh, transformations. And it's one of the fields that has been uh, developed um, extensively over the last um, two decades, um, essentially. So now the question, the obvious question is, why do we have to care um, about transition metal catalyzed reactions? And the first problem that we'll see is that um, it's, it specifically comes into play when we deal with um, aromatic substitutions. And we have already seen that uh, the electrophilic aromatic substitution, so SEAR um, and the SNAR rely mostly on the electronics of the aromatic ring. And SNAR rely on electronics of aromatic. And we learned um, over the last couple of lectures that that essentially dictates oftentimes what substitution patterns are accessible. And uh, at times you really have to go out of your way in order to, uh, to, make, these, um, to make these transformations or these substitutions uh, work. The other type of reactions that we have looked at uh, that are useful to create substitutions um, are benzyme reactions. And we know from those that they tend to give mixtures. Um, give mixtures. And they require harsh conditions. Right? So um, ideally what we would be looking for if we were to think about like um, a, a dream reaction uh, and how to make it work would be something like this, where we could have, let's say a simple aromatic ring with a functional group X on there. Um, and let's say an arbitrary substituent R. So this basically means that uh, this R could be in any position on uh, this aromatic ring. And I would take like something like a nucleophile here and I would be able to replace this X by the nucleophile on the aromatic ring. So do a displacement reaction here essentially. And ideally that would give me something um, like the substitution product, again, the R could be in any position that I wanted, but now this nucleophile is in this new position, plus I have this X minus now as, um, as a side product. Now, ideally, um, this is kind of what, uh, what we all dream about and what we would like to be able to do. Uh, and I think you obviously see the limitations that come into play when we use the traditional electrophilic aromatic substitution, nucleophilic aromatic substitution, or the benzyme reactions. Because even though we can do some of this, it's always limited by the position of this residue and the nature of this X group, for example. And the other thing is like the nature of these, these nucleophiles. So what we really want is like reactions that work where R um, is, is um, electron rich or poor, um, in any position so it doesn't matter whether it's ortho meta or para and um, that we have an arbitrary nucleophile so a nucleophile can ideally be anything that would simplify our work um, a lot right um, the issue is that the direct nucleophilic displacement, as I have drawn it here, is a reaction that is not possible. So 
direct um, nucleophilic displacement is not possible under, uh, under all these arbitrary um, conditions. And this is essentially what, what was the inspiration to, uh, to start all this work on uh, transition metal catalyzed reactions, the need to fill essentially this gap to make this type of chemistry um, more accessible. Now, transition metals allow us to get around this, and this is what we are going to be talking about mostly today. Um, so uh, the, the fundamental process of a transition metal catalyzed reaction uh, follows always exactly the same scheme or the same recipe, essentially. So we can generalize this very easily. So we're going to call this now cross-coupling reaction. Reaction. And this is now kind of a general, um, a general view of that. And um, when we talk about cross-coupling reactions, no matter what the nucleophile is and no matter what the, the electrophile is in that case, um, we usually group them into three individual steps that the cross-coupling reaction has to go through. And we're just going to go over these um, to, to kind of create a background uh, to analyze all the other reactions that will follow. So let's go back to our starting material again. We have our aromatic ring with an arbitrary group X here, and we have um, a, a substituent R um, attached to that. Now, um, these are uh, transition metal catalyzed reactions, so you have to bring in a transition metal in order to make this work, and um, we're just going to keep this here generic. We're just going to abbreviate this as uh, the metal, and we pick here this little um, exponent n as the oxidation state. So this is this is your metal, um, and this here is your oxidation state. So this is usually um, zero, two, or four, or something in between, right? Okay. Now, the first step in all of these cross-coupling reactions is called uh, the oxidative addition. So let's call this step one, um, oxidative addition. So the name already says that something has to be oxidized. And what is oxidized is essentially this transition metal that we have here. So if we draw the arrow here and we say like um, step one, this is our oxidative addition. What happens is that this metal essentially inserts into this carbon X bond here. Um, so it's basically then a carbon metal X bond. So what you get is something like this. Again, our residue R here, and then we have our metal, and then we can draw down here, like call this um, uh, the, the X here. Now what happened as part of this, since it's an oxidation, is that the oxidation state of the metal increased. Here initially we said it was N, and in this, in this state here it is N plus two. So whatever this initial N was, um, it's increased by, um, by plus two, essentially. Now, the, the next step um, that we have in this, in this mechanism is called uh, the transmetallation. So this is step two. Um, step two, transmetallation. And as the name already describes, it's essentially that uh, uh, the metal or a metal is exchanged um, in this process. So oftentimes you think about this as the, the nucleophile here. Let's draw a nucleophile minus here. And this is connected to some arbitrary metal uh, counter ions. So this, uh, how should we call this? Um, Maybe it's, let's lose a different color, uh, not to create confusion here. This is basically our metal from which we transfer it. So this is M plus and uh, nucleophile minus, right? Okay, as part of this transmetallation, now you have the lone pair of um, 
the, the nucleophile attacking um, the metal and you kick out this X. So it's basically a, um, a ligand exchange reaction in, in this case. And what you kick out as part of this process is essentially M plus, that was the metal that we had over here. And uh, you have X minus um, on this side. But the product of this reaction, this ligand exchange reaction is again, our aromatic ring with the R here. Then we have our metal. The oxidation state does not change in this step. So N plus two. And then we have whatever this nucleophile was that we had um, attached um, to there, right? All right, and so this is basically uh, the, the first two steps um, of this reaction. The last one is actually the one that forms the new carbon nucleophile bond. And you can think about this essentially as simply excising this, uh, this metal atom out of this, um, this uh, three atom bond here. So carbon, metal, nucleophile, you form a carbon nucleophile bond and you kick out um, uh, the metal. And uh, befittingly, this is called uh, the reductive um, elimination. So this is step three. This is reductive elimination. And what happens here is that you form the new carbon nucleophile bond. And as part of this, you kick out um, the transition metal. And since it's a reduction, uh, this oxidation state changes again, and you regenerate um, your original oxidation state that you had introduced here. So this is why this is a catalytic cycle. You basically do not use up this transition metal, but um, you regenerate it at the end of this reaction again. And basically this metal here can go on uh, to do many more reactions, um, often thousands or ten thousands of transformations um, that they catalyze that, um, that always regenerate essentially this metal, um, this metal back. So metal is regenerated. All right, so now the, the reactions that we are gonna be focusing on here mostly as part of this introductory course is um, uh, reactions that use palladium, nickel, or copper as these transition metals. So um, you can say here we focus on palladium, nickel catalyzed reactions, um, and copper catalyzed reactions. But you will quickly realize that if you go through the literature, there's a wide variety that spans almost the entire um, uh, D series of atoms. Um, and uh, there's very different transformations, uh, some, some very, very useful transformations uh, involved in this chemistry that use some very exotic metals. Um, but here to, to introduce this type of chemistry, we're gonna focus mostly on these, um, on the, these three um, species here. All right, now um, we have to have a little bit of closer look at uh, this magic here with this oxidation state. And this is essentially uh, what we're gonna start looking at first here, how to determine effectively the oxidation state um, of uh, transition metal complexes. So establishing um, metal oxidation states. Now here's something that, um, that has caused in the past um, a little bit confusion. Um, hello, focus please, here. Um, that has caused a little bit confusion in the past uh, uh, regarding the uh, oxidation state nomenclature. And there's like in chemistry, there remain two big schools of inorganic chemists uh, fighting each other about um, which type of nomenclature is uh, the, the right one. And some, some of the senior colleagues are very, very adamant about one or the other. Um, 
as an organic chemist, I have to say that uh, it doesn't really matter because this concept of oxidation states is anyways just a, um, a model system that helps you explain something. So the absolute numerical value is, is not that relevant as actually the change in the numerical value. That's why I wrote it as oxidation from N to N plus two, rather than giving you a specific number. But it's important still to recognize this change. And so that's why we're gonna go through, um, um, through this exercise a little bit here. So let's pick a very generic and, uh, and common catalyst uh, that is used um, in, uh, in these systems. And this is palladium uh, tetrachis trisphenylphosphine. So it's one of the most common catalysts used in transition metal catalyzed um, reactions. So this is a, is a palladium atom essentially that is linked to four triphenylphosphines. So um, pH three, P, pH three, P, pH three, Right. So um, this is, uh, let's just give it a name, um, palladium tetrachis, tetrachis and tris, uh, um, usually this is abbreviated uh, uh, as, as tetrachis because that's kind of like the standard catalyst. All right, so the way you determine the oxidation state um, of this, this metal, this palladium metal in this catalyst is by, uh, by just imagining that you remove um, uh, all the ligands from the metal in their most stable form. So I'm not going to draw this as a real reaction because that's not, um, that's not realistic. This is kind of a thought experiment. So we're going to remove the ligands in most stable form. Now the most stable form of these triphenylphosphines is of course the neutral uh, triphenylphosphine, right? So if you do that, you end up with something that looks like this, palladium, and then you have P, pH3, P, pH3, P, pH3, and P, pH3. And all of these essentially have their lone pair um, uh, on, on the phosphorus. Now all of these are neutral. So these are neutral, let's do this in red. So the remaining charge on the palladium is essentially then zero. So it's neutral metallic palladium, right? So palladium zero in this case. Um, palladium is in oxidation state zero. Now this applies, or this, this, this uh, thought experiment, you can apply it to many, uh, many, many other catalysts. And we're just gonna go through a couple of examples um, as, as kind of a practice. And you can, if you want to, you can stop the video and kind of try to solve this yourself. But um, let's say we have this nickel complex here. And um, this is another common one that has now a bidentate uh, palladium ba uh, uh, phosphorus-based ligand. And on the other side, it has uh, two chlorine atoms. And each of these has two additional phenol rings attached to it. Right? Something like this. So we can do exactly the same thought experiment again and remove the ligands in their most stable form. So for the, for the phosphines, uh, that is obviously the, the neutral form. So we have um, phosphorus um, with their lone pairs here and each of them with a phenyl ring, two phenyl rings, sorry. And then we have our nickel 
And we have to determine what the oxidation state of that is. But if we remove the chlorides here, the most stable form um, of this chloride is, of course, the anionic species. If you removed it mutually, you would end up with a radical. We know that chlorine radicals, or we'll learn later that chlorine radicals are very, very reactive. So Cl minus um, looks like the, the most promising um, and most stable species um, that you can generate here. Now, we know that the overall complex here um, started out as neutral, right? So we have to compensate here if we pulled off the ligands uh, for these two charges. So that means that uh, this nickel uh, in, this, uh, in this complex here has to have the oxidation state uh, two plus, right? So this basically just comes out of the, um, the, the um, addition, of the, addition of the charges. Two negative charges are compensated by a uh, uh, doubly positively charged um, nickel atom. Now we can go through a couple more of these examples just to kind of um, drive this idea home. So maybe we can look at another palladium complex. So if you have, for example, the bisacetate complex, um, Let's do something like this. There's a question. Just a second. Yeah. What was your question? Um, it's in the chat box. I don't have the chat box here. You have to give me a second. Um, okay, chat. Should the phosphorus atoms initially have a positive charge? Um, what do you mean by initially? So if you have this structure, this is a neutral complex, right? So you have no charge in this. The same thing is true for this complex here. There's no charge in there, right? So if I remove these ligands, the phosphorus ligands in their most stable form, they are neutral, right? So if I remove them and then add up the, the charge that I have to compensate, in this case, they are all neutral. There's no charge that I have to compensate with the metal. So this remains oxidation state zero. Here, you basically have two charges from the chlorides. These are neutral. So you only have to uh, compensate for, for two charges, right? A, a phosphorus with a positive charge would again be, um, be a radical species. So this would not be the most stable form of that ligand, right? Okay. Let me see, where were we? Okay, we were with the, um, Remove this here. Okay, so we were with the um, palladium bisacetate complex. So in this case, um, we can play exactly the same game again, the same thought experiment. We remove the ligands in their most stable form. Now, again, we could say that we remove them as a radical, but we know that radicals are basically they are neutral in this case, but they are essentially. Um, um, highly reactive species. So the easier way to remove this in a stable form is essentially as the acetate, acetate anion. So you basically take these electrons with the system. So you end up then with um, CH3, O, O with a negative charge here. Then you have the palladium in the center and on the other side you have exactly the same. And then if you add up the charges, now you have a negative charge here. This is minus one. You have a negative charge here. This is minus one. The overall complex in the beginning was neutral. So the palladium has to compensate for these two charges. So palladium here in this case is plus two then, right? Um, now, I wanna bring in one example that is relevant for, um, or more relevant for the, for the mechanism itself. And this is an uh, organometallic complex. So if you have um, palladium and you have three different ligands on here, so triphenylphosphine, two triphenylphosphines, um, and on this side, let's say you already have an aromatic um, ring attached to it. So this would look something like the oxidative addition product 
um, of um, uh, palladium catalyzed um, transformation. So if we now dissect this again in our thought experiment, we already know that the phosphenes are gonna be separated as neutral um, species. So um, we end up having PH3P as neutral. Um, then we have the bromide here. Let's draw the palladium in the center first. Um, this is such, such, essentially exactly the same thing as we had with the, um, with the chlorides previously. And then there's a general convention that the, the aromatic rings are um, dissociated as essentially the anions, right? So you would remove this as, uh, as the anion here. And that again gives you like the same, same mechanism that we had up here. This gives you one negative charge. This gives you one negative charge. So the palladium in this case has to be plus two, right? Um, now, when we look a little bit closer at um, all these possible ligands that you will encounter um, as part of these transition metal catalyzed reactions, there's more or less two trends that you, that you can see. Um, and this kind of maybe summarizes this a little bit, the type of ligands. And they fall either under the neutral ligands And the ones that we have seen so far is uh, the trialkyl or triaryl phosphenes. So I'm going to just abbreviate this as a generic R. So this is a neutral one. Another one that obviously falls under this category is the uh, trialkyl or aryl amines. So R3N is exactly the same. So those are going to be neutral ligands. And then basically you have the negatively charged ligands. And these are all essentially the anions that we have seen. So for example, Cl minus, um, Br minus, um, acetate uh, was another one. And then all carbon ligands. So whether this is a methyl group or whether this is an aryl group or whether this is any other alkyl group, you usually remove them as the closed shell negatively charged, um, charged species. And that gives you kind of an idea to quickly assess the, the oxidation state um, of, the, of the transition metal um, that you'll be dealing with. Okay, now that we've set kind of like the groundworks for transition metal catalyzed reactions, what we want to move to now is really the, the, a little bit of closer look at this, uh, at this generic mechanism and um, how this oxidative addition, transmetallation, and reductive elimination actually work. And uh, in that context, we are going to look at um, a couple of examples. We're going to focus on one reaction uh, today only, and this is the palladium catalyzed cross coupling. So, palladium catalyzed. Um, cross coupling. And uh, just kind of to make this, this very generic um, for, this, for this relatively big class of, of reactions, um, we're going to be dealing with um, an aromatic ring in most cases um, that has a, a functional group X on there. Another alternative that you'll find sometimes here is um, an uh, a vinylic uh, system where you have kind of like a double bond um, uh, that is attached to an X. But the key factor here is carbon. The carbon is mostly um, SP, sp2 hybridized in this case. So this carbon here is sp2 and this carbon here is sp2. That's critical for, for most of these reactions. And this X um, can span a wide variety of uh, structures. Most common you'll see here the halogens, so iodide, for example, bromide, um, then chloride, um, less often fluoride, um, but what you can see uh, as, as an pseudo-halogen is the triflate. 
so trifluorosulfonic acid um, um, substituents. They react basically uh, the same way that the halogens will react, and that's why we call them pseudo, pseudo halogens. Now, um, we need this other partner in the reaction that, is, um, that transmetallates essentially our other group, and we're going to generically call this Rm here. And maybe we should, just to keep it consistent, pick the same color here. This was the orange M that we had in our introductory mechanism. Um, this R here can have um, different uh, um, hybridization. So it can be either sp3, it can be sp2, and it can be sp hybridized. Um, this M um, depends on what specific reaction you're looking at, but it can either be boron, and then we call this the Suzuki reaction. Um, it can be tin. Then we call it the stele. And then it can be magnesium. And uh, then we call it generally the Kumara coupling. And these are basically just named after the, um, the, the inventors um, of, um, of that specific um, reaction. And they use this kind of like pseudonyms in the, in the literature. Every chemist knows what the Suzuki or Stilic coupling or Kumada coupling is. And uh, that makes conversations a lot easier. There's plenty other metals that you could use here, but those are the ones that we'll focus on here mostly because they cover more or less, I want to say 80 to 90 percent um, of, um, of the reactions that, that are in the literature. Um, now, um, we still need our catalyst, and I'm just going to gen generically here add a catalyst with four ligands or N with N ligands, keep it even more generic, and we're going to make it a, a palladium zero catalyst here. So the oxidation state is, is going to be zero. So this could be, for example, the palladium tetrachis trisphenylphosphine that we have, right? And um, the product of this reaction then is going to be the substitution of this X here by this R group. So you're going to have an R group here. Or if we use this one here as a substrate, we basically would be able to couple the R to the position where the X was um, originally. Now, um, when we, this is kind of more or less the mechanism or the, the, the reaction that we drew out uh, previously. Um, when it comes to these transition metal catalyzed uh, transformations, uh, it's often not very informative and useful to use this um, arrow pushing mechanism that we have seen for many of the polar reactions previously. But what is more commonly used in that context is actually um, a catalytic cycle. And that's what we want to go over right now for, for a very generic uh, palladium catalyzed cross coupling reaction. So the catalytic cycle. All right, so um, usually this catalytic cycle starts out with a catalyst uh, precursor. That's essentially the form or the species of the catalyst that you throw into the reaction mixture. Now, if we, if we pick just a generic catalyst here, let's say um, palladium um, P, PH3, and let's say N here, uh, then this catalyst actually is, is in, its, in its current form, if it has all N ligands attached to it, it is not an active species and cannot catalyze um, any reaction. What has to happen first is that it has to lose enough of these ligands, enough of these bulky ligands, in order to, uh, to open an uh, uh, unsaturated coordination site um, on the palladium itself. You can think about these, these triphenylphosphines here, for example, as blocking all possible uh, um, coordination sites around this metal. So you have to dissociate them. And those are just simple ligand dissociation reactions. So you can say like here, minus two PPH3. And if you want to go back here, of course, this is reversible, plus two PPH3. Um, what you're left with then is essentially um, a, a catalytic species. And let's say for this example, N equals um, four here. Um, then you have a, a catalyst 
that has now left, is left now with two triphenylphosphines. And on the other side, where these two other triphenylphosphines were attached, you now have kind of what you, what you can think about as an open coordination site that can now be attacked uh, by, um, by, other, um, by other reagents. So it's a vacant site um, at, the, at the metal complex. Now you need this vacant site in order to, um, to access um, the mechanism. And if we, let's see, if we draw this out here, let's do it something like this. Um, what comes in at this state then is basically the, um, the, the first reaction step that we talked about, the oxidative addition. And for that, we need something like an aromatic ring that has some form of this X that we discussed just in the, in the previous slide, right? And this is essentially your oxidative, um, oxidative addition. So oxidative addition. If you go back in your notes, you already know what the product of this is going to be. It's essentially a tetracoordinate palladium, palladium, and then we have, um, let's put the aromatic ring up here. We have here the X, and on the other side, we still have our triphenylphosphine, right? Okay, let's take a little bit of closer look at the oxidation states um, here, what happened in this process. The oxidation state of this species, even though, though we dissociated two of these ligands, is still zero. So we can draw out here, the oxidation state of this palladium here is zero, right? If we did the thought experiment on this system, we could remove these as neutral ligands, and each of these would be negatively charged, one minus. So this palladium needs to be two plus. Right? So this is why this step here is an oxidative addition. It oxidizes, it formally oxidizes uh, the metal. And the oxidation state changes um, by, by plus two. Now, from here, we know that the next step is the, is the transmetallation. And we can draw this here in, in a circle, maybe a little bit. So here now we need, um, let's say, R. Let's pick our orange metal again here. And what we're going to kick out as part of this is going to be our X. So we're essentially replacing now this X by this substituent um, or by, by, this, by this ligand R. And this is your transmetallation step. Now, it doesn't change anything, strictly speaking, in the complex. It basically just replaces this X by, um, by this R. So there's an M. This, this is a mistake. This is M. This is not R. OK. So um, what you have here, then, is um, palladium. You have your aromatic ring here. You have this R that came from, from this species here. And then on this side, you have still your neutral ligands attached to this side, okay? So we had step one, which was the oxidative addition. Step two, which is the transmetallation, the exchange of this X and this R at the metal centers. And then we end up with this, um, with this uh, intermediate here. Now, what we're left with is um, we have to do the reductive elimination that essentially generates um, our product that we're interested in. And at the same time in this step, we need to regenerate our catalyst because this does not get consumed um, in this process. And the way this works is essentially through the reductive elimination. So if we draw this arrow here, we can then draw out um, our excision of the product. And here we know that um, the product that we're going to get out of this is basically this one here, that's the reductive elimination. And in the process, it regenerates um, our, 
um, our original catalyst species again. Now, again, from here to here, we can count the electrons again um, on the palladium center. So these can be removed as neutrals. Each of these is removed as a minus one ligand. And then basically the palladium here is still two plus. So in the transmetallation, the oxidation state of the metal does not change, right? However, in the reductive elimination, we basically reduce the metal by kicking out these two, uh, these two ligands and bonding them covalently together. And uh, we are left back with essentially the palladium zero that can then either coordinate a triphenylphosphine and go off the cycle or reversibly go off the cycle, or it can basically um, attack uh, the next substrate and go through the cycle over um, and over again. So this is kind of like the, the, the most generic, general, generic concept of, um, of uh, transition metal catalyzed reactions. It's most useful to draw them always in kind of this circle, um, starting with the oxidative addition, the transmetallation, and then the reductive elimination that regenerates um, our, um, original, uh, our original catalyst. Now we want to jump into one very specific reaction today, and that is the, the Suzuki coupling. And it follows exactly this, this mechanistic cycle that, that we have drawn out um, just a second ago. So Suzuki cross coupling. Um, now I'm just gonna show you one, um, one simple example of this reaction, um, let's say, Um, let's take a typical scenario where you would have, let's say you have a phenol or something like that, an OH, and you want to substitute essentially the position where this hydroxyl group is uh, down here. Now this hydroxyl group itself does not participate in cross-coupling reactions, but we can use, remember, we can turn this into a triflate in one step, and that would be essentially a substrate um, for a palladium catalyzed um, cross-coupling. So how do we do this? Well, we need a base, and then we need basically triflic and hydride. So for those of you um, who remember this, we have looked at this a couple of times already as a protecting group, um, S -O -O -S -O -O and then CF3. So usually you can see this or um, you can see this also as triflic and hydride as an abbreviated form, right? Okay, now that you have that, you basically made uh, the triflate out of this. And now what was previously your unreactive phenol is now um, a, a, a good substrate for uh, a cross-coupling reaction. Now, the other partner that you would need for, to make this a Suzuki coupling is some form of a boron species. And um, the most common ones that are used for these reactions are boronic um, esters, uh, boronic esters or boronic acids. So let's keep it simple here and just use a boronic acid. So let's see, methyl um, B, OH2. Now this is now your, um, your, your metal. And maybe if we pick like our color scheme here again, so this is essentially your orange metal here. And then uh, the, the other part that you need in this reaction is your, um, is your transition metal catalyst. And in this case, we can just use the, the simple generic um, palladium tetrachis. So palladium P, pH3, 4. And usually you use here um, um, a 5% loading um, with respect to the substrate. Uh, then you need a solvent, um, let's say dioxane or THF is, is pretty good for these reactions. Um, and you, you need a base and oftentimes these are phosphates. So potassium um, phosphate, for example, um, or you can also use sodium hydroxide um, 
uh, to make this uh, reaction work. Um, and what you get out of this is basically the substitution of this triflate by whatever residue here, whatever alkyl residue was attached uh, to your boron. So the product then is forming a new carbon-carbon bond here. Um, and it's giving you um, this as, as the product. Now, if you think about the value of this reaction, I think it becomes pretty obvious if you try to figure out a way of how to make this substrate here in, uh, in very few steps from a starting material like this one. It is possible, I don't deny that, but um, it's an involved synthesis and you have to get around several corners uh, in order to make this work. This is a lot easier turning this into a triflate and then doing, um, doing the cross-coupling reaction, right? Now, we can draw out the, um, the mechanism for this specific reaction. And again, we would use the, um, the, the catalytic cycle here. Um, so let's look at the mechanism. So we have palladium tetrachis as our source catalyst. So palladium and this has to lose two ligands in order to form um, the active species. So palladium this is now the active species that has a vacant coordination site um, that can now react uh, with, uh, with our substrate in the oxidative um, uh, addition. And mechanistically, it follows exactly the same, the same route that we had described um, previously. So we can bring our substrate in here. So this was OME and then O triflate. Um, and this basically does the oxidative addition, um, palladium, P pH3 and um, OME. Key factor here is pay attention to this. It retains the positional selectivity. So wherever the triflate was is the position that will be bound to the palladium and is later the position that uh, we will replace with our, um, with our uh, the, the residue on the boronic acid. And down here, the other ligand is O triflate. Now we can go in again and check the oxidation states. This was zero, and this is uh, plus two for this reaction, right? Now from here on, we, uh, we go on to the transmetallation. And um, as previously discussed, we bring in here uh, the uh, boronic acid. So in this case, on here, OH2. And uh, what we kick out at the end is essentially, um, let's do boron. So it replaces this triflate here. So O triflate, and then we have OH2 on the other side. This is basically the transmetallation product, right? So this residue R here, replaces this triflate on the palladium complex. So the transmetallation product then is going to be palladium P, pH3, P, pH3. Then we still have our aromatic ring attached to this. And down here we have our allyl system, right? And now the last step again, um, so wait, this is still oxidation state two plus. And the last step is the reductive elimination that leads back um, to our original catalyst and spits out our product, which is now um, the substitution or the cross coupling product that has the allylic substituent attached um, to the bottom of it.
right? And again, we could go in here and label these individual steps. So this is the oxidative addition. This is transmetallation. And this is reductive elimination. So mechanistically, it works exactly the same way as, as we have talked about before. Just in this case, we are actually specifically looking at, um, at uh, the boronic acids as the transmetallating agent. And that's specific to the, to the Suzuki reaction. Now, as I said previously, uh, we are not only restricted to these, um, to these triflates here or these aromatic substituents here or I mean, we talked about halides, bromides, chlorides, um, or triflates here. Uh, we can also do this with um, vinylic um, groups. The important thing is only that this carbon atom here at this position is sp2 hybridized uh, in order to make that work. And um, just to give you an example, maybe, that is, that is uh, industrially actually very relevant. So cross-coupling. with vinylic substrates. Um, this is actually a synthesis um, that is done on a, on a pretty large scale industrially. Um, and it's actually um, a feed additive for, um, um, for the farming industry. So we have um, some methyl groups here, and then you have a conjugated pi system. And then at the end of this, you have an iodine, other methyl group here. And uh, the other substrate that um, the other coupling partner in this reaction is a boronic ester. So um, let's use our B here again. And at the end here, you have an alcohol. And maybe just to abbreviate this here, O, O, um, um, something like this. So this is a boronic, um, a boronic ester. So these work uh, basically the same way as, um, as the bronic acids. Now, if you mix these two together in the presence of a palladium catalyst, um, so we can gen generically here say just palladium zero, um, and uh, you need a base in order to, to make that work. What you get out of this is a conjugated system. Now this iodine has been replaced by whatever this residue was on here. So and OH um, on this side. Now you might know this compound or you might have seen this compound um, previously. This is called retinol. Um, uh, related to retinol, which is basically the aldehyde of the species, that's, that's basically what allows you um, to see. Um, that's kind of the, the underlying um, cis-trans isomerization that, um, that leads to vision. And um, in, in the industry, you usually see this as vitamin A, right? And this is actually done on an industrial scale with this palladium cross-coupling chemistry from these fairly simple, um, simply accessible uh, precursors. And it's very neat that it allows you to do this cross-coupling here. You need very little palladium um, and these starting materials are uh, readily accessible. Now, the last thing that I want to go over today a little bit is um, the selectivity of these, um, these cross-coupling reactions and specifically 
We have seen several of these uh, halides or triflates um, in this series already. It turns out that um, they differ significantly in their, um, in their reactivity in these cross-coupling reactions. So, um, so let's say reactivity of halides. So um, the series here uh, follows essentially the bond dissociation energy. So Ri is significantly more reactive um, than Rbr, and that is a lot more reactive um, than the chloride. And this is infinitely more reactive um, than the fluoride. Now, the simple series here allows you to, um, uh, to, to perform these cross-coupling reactions selectively in the presence, for example, of iodides and bromides on the same, um, same molecule. So you can do um, selectivity in cross-coupling. And I'm just going to show you a simple example here. Let's say you have a substrate that has both an iodine and a bromine uh, um, on, the same, on the same molecule. Now, if you subject this uh, to a first cross-coupling reaction with, let's say, an aryl-boronic acid, and let's say we use... Um, Palladium tetrachis, um, sodium carbonate as a base, and THF water as, um, as the solvent, you can get a high selectivity for substituting the iodine over um, the bromine. So your product your major product that you're going to expect to get out of this reaction still has the bromine on this side, but has substituted selectively the iodine with um, your aromatic ring. And now you can do additional transformations with this now. So you could go ahead and subject this to a second Suzuki reaction. Let's say in this case you use, um, let's say we use this here, another boronic acid. And this time we use um, palladium four, um, and we use um, whatever we use here, potassium phosphate, for example. Um, and let's say THF water. This probably needs a little bit higher temperature in order to, to, to work, but you get the selectivity out of it that um, your substitution product will then selectively go after um, the bromine. And it's not the reaction conditions that dictate that, but essentially the reactivity of the substrate. So um, pretty much no matter what conditions you pick here specifically, it will always go after the iodine first and then uh, only second then uh, it will go after um, the bromine. Right? So if you want to place specific substituents onto specific positions on an aromatic ring, it's really good to have this tool available that you can substitute the iodines over the bromines and over the chlorines. But iodine bromine is the most common selectivity um, that you'll see here. Okay. So the last thing um, we want to talk about today is, of course, how to make all the substrates. I mean, we introduced the Suzuki reaction without actually discussing in great detail how we get, um, how we get access um, to all of these substrates. And um, we have shown some of them. So to make the triflate, for example, we've had that in an example. But um, more specifically, we want to talk about uh, all, the, all the possible transformations hey. Yes? Is there a question? Okay. So we want to talk about the, the substrate. So how to make substrates 
for Suzuki. Um, now, one, we have the aryl halides. We know how to do this. This is just simple um, um, electrophilic aromatic substitution. So aryl halides, and we know we can use the standard SEAR chemistry, right? That's nothing new. Um, two, we had the aryl triflates. And this is basically just a, a protection of, of phenols. We can generate these um, from phenols or alcohol. So um, you could, for example, get OH and you treat this with triflic anhydride in a base, and um, what you get is um, the triflate. We've seen this before in one of the examples, right? So that's relatively straightforward. Um, but there's another trick that you can use in order to make um, uh, the vinyl triflates. Um, so vinyl triflates, and we've seen this um, before too. So let's say you have you could, for example, start out with a ketone. And uh, you can do um, an enolization of this. Let's use LDA, for example, here. Um, and you'll generate an intermediate species that then is the enolate. Um, lithium counter ion here, methyl group here. And then you could uh, quench this reaction with triflic anhydride and basically take this alcohol and turn it into the vinyl triflate, right? So ketones are very good substrates uh, to make this um, too. You know this enolization chemistry already, that's nothing, um, nothing new. So oh, triflate, right? So that's kind of then basically a substrate that uh, would be a, a vinylic triflate that would be substituting at this position here. And in the aryl triflate, it would be substituting um, at, at this carbon atom, right? Um, now, the key substrate that we have not talked about yet are the, are the boronic acids and how to, how to make those. And just going to jump over to a new slide because we need a little bit more space. I think this was then point three. And this is the boronic acids. And making these boronic acids is, is really very straightforward. Um, we use chemistry that we have seen several times already. The most common ways are either directly from a Grignard reagent or from an organolithium reagent, right? And um, the Grignard reagent route just simply starts with making a Grignard reagent, let's say from an aryl bromide. Um, you treat this um, with magnesium zero and um, uh, let's say in diethyl ether. And what this gives you is basically your Grignard reagent, magnesium Br. And then you usually use a substrate that is a boronic ester that's most commonly used in these transformations. So let's say something like this, um, OME. OME, OME. And what this does is essentially, um, it takes the, the electrons in this bond, this is basically the negatively charged carbon atom, and substitutes um, the, um, or attacks essentially the, the electrophilic boron center. So this is essentially a Lewis, um, Lewis acid here. And what you get out of this, is a, is a boronate, so it's a negatively charged um, boron atom. Um, let's see if I can draw this. So the boron here, and then it still has like three methoxy groups on there. And 
And of course, all of this is negatively charged. Uh, the counter ion to this will be the magnesium um, bromide. So MgBr plus is, uh, is essentially the counter ion. And what usually happens here is that this collapses and forms uh, the boronic ester. So one of these OME is kicked out uh, to create a neutral species again. So this is then the OME, OME. And uh, what you lose here is minus Mg, Br, OME. This is basically the salt. Uh, that you precipitate from that. And then under slightly acidic conditions, you can hydrolyze this um, H3O plus. Usually this happens during the workup and you end up with the bronic acid. So this is basically uh, an easy way from a simple substrate um, like an aryl halide to give you um, uh, uh, boronic um, acid. Um, the same thing uh, works for, um, for organolithium reagents. So if we do the same thing instead of a, a, a green air reagent, we can take, let's say, uh, say an aryl iodide in this case, and we treat this with butyl lithium. What we get is a lithium halogen exchange where we end up with the iodine being transferred and you create an organolithium reagent. So the lithium replaces um, this, uh, this iodine here. And from here, it's exa exactly the same way as, as before for the Grignard reagent. So from here on, it's exactly the same way as, as we saw here. So first, you treat this with the um, boronic uh, ester. Well, and then in the second step, you um, do an um, aqueous acidic workup, and that gives you the boronic acid, right? So all of these steps are, um, you're, you're familiar with that already, um, green, making Grignard reagents and basically having the negative charge on the Grignard reagent or on the organolithium reagent attack uh, the boron, and then it's basically the same way as we've seen before. You eliminate, and then the last step is a hydrolysis. So that's the easiest way to make, um, to make these boronic acids. And you see that they come from substrates that are readily available. Um, and you have many ways of how to, how to generate these and how to turn um, your starting materials into precursors for, uh, for boronic acids. Um, Okay, so this is the point um, where I want to stop today. Um, on Thursday, we're going to finish this, uh, this subchapter, and we're going to introduce a couple more of these cross-coupling reactions. Specifically, we're going to be talking about the Stille coupling. We're going to be talking about the Kumara coupling, the Sonogashira coupling, and uh, the Heck reaction. So these are basically um, another four variants of this uh, transition metal catalyzed cross-coupling chemistry that we're going to introduce. And, um, and after that, we're going to move on into um, the chapter of pericyclic reactions. Okay, uh, this is the end of today's lecture. Um, I have office hours at 9.30. If you have questions, please come to that. If not, I'll see you all on Thursday. Thank you, Professor.